Good morning to everyone from, from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, I'm Tracy Adams and welcoming you all to the panel on boundaries and belonging, language, gender, and religious descent. And I'm just gonna leave it to the panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their work and how this paper fits into that work. So Corinne, would you like to start for us? Sure, uh, my name is Corinne Gersang and I just finished my PhD at the University of Kentucky and I'll be starting a new job at Erskine College in South Carolina this fall. Uh, this particular paper is building off of my dissertation. Uh, while writing my dissertation on the dissolution of convents during the French Revolution, I ran into this one nun whose journal was by Gabrielle Gauchat, and she constantly was using this taste language to describe her relationship with God, and these religious experiences, and it, it caught my eye. It didn't fit into the dissertation, so um, I'm kind of starting a new project focusing on emotion and the senses, uh, which is a little bit outside of what my dissertation was on, but I'm hoping that this works and you guys can give me some good feedback on that. And Jonathan Reed, would you introduce yourself for us? Right. Hello, my name is Jonathan Smith. I'm um, a late comer. I took my first degree when I was 66 and my PhD when I was 77. Uh, I am now a research fellow at Birkbeck at London, University of London, thanks to the kind offices of people who've taken pity on me. I am a basically a student of the revolution. My speciality is, has been religion in the revolution. Uh, I'm going to do a plug in here. There's a wonderful book coming out shortly called Life in the French Revolution by Bloomsbury, of which I contributed a chapter on religion. You should look at it and I will send you all a piece of uh, froth so you can see it, but it's a lovely book. Anyway, uh, my last book was Robespierre and the Fed de la Suprême, The Search for a Republican Identity. Now, the whole idea, what I've been working on since then and this has something to do with both um, Corinne and Anne Helene, is I've been working on, among other things, the prophetesses of the revolution. Working on Catherine Théo, working on Suzette Labrousse, on the Farinist, and various other uh, oddballs who whizzed in and out of the religious life of the revolution. I'm also uh, involved with two of my friends, one of whom, some of whom, whose work you may have read, uh, Rodney Dean, for example, on the Constitutional Church. So this paper which I produced today is a bit of a sideways look. It started life because I was getting very confused about who lost his head where and when. And I sat down and spent a lot of time diving through the bits of paper in France, mostly, and finding out where the where where the, the infernal machine finished up, who was using it, and who was being used by it, and what did they do with the bodies? And it gave rise to this paper. Had I known that this was going to be this particular, shall we say, panel, I would have offered you a paper, probably on Catherine Théo and Suzette Labrousse. But never mind. I hope you enjoy what I do offer, and I'm very pleased to be with you all. Mm. So, Annalyn, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. So, um, I'm assistant, oh, sorry, sorry, my camera is here. So, I'm assistant professor of French Francophone Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So, I have a broad range of interests, really, from uh, that goes, spans from the 12th to the 16th century. <laughs> and uh, so, I've been at work on a book on the history of French in what I call the long 14th century, uh, which is currently under review. So this particular presentation fits into my, my current research interest. However, uh, a bit like Jonathan, well, my initial goal was really to really explore um, some of the theories of Jean Gerson going into the early modern period in the 16th century. Um, I was particularly interested in um, this question of effect as it works with the mystics, early modern, and especially the Moderna. But <laughs> given the circumstance, I was unable 
people uh, to do the research. It was a newer project, I, I have to admit. So I decided to resituate Gerson in its medieval, uh, late medieval context, but I still would like to explore that further moving forward as a precursor rather than how his, coming, uh, his theories are coming about, which I'm talking ab about today. So there are two things that interest me in particular, which I think speak to some of, of your papers today. Uh, this idea of effect, especially um, because I was very uh, intrigued by the fact that usually we consider effect as a non non-linguistic, um, more bodily experience. And I'm interested how Gerson uh, relates effect to language, uh, especially in this uh, sort of pre-humanistic or humanistic period of the late medieval, early uh, 16th century period, which is um, very bilingual and how it relates to this idea of Latin vernacular and, and affect theory. So that's one thing, and I think it speaks to, to Corinne, uh, this idea of bodily experience. And, but so the question related to language is that feels been less explored during that period. Uh, another thing which I think also is a, a very interesting to me and I wish to explore further and also I think speaks to, to, to all papers today, uh, the idea of uh, effect moving from an individual experience um, as an embodied uh, individual experience uh, to uh, a more a communal or uh, experience and how controlling effect from individual creates actually a, a healthy body politic, right? So individual bodies and a healthy body politic and political order. And I, I felt like all papers today discuss that, right? We have dissent, we have uh, this question, even during the revolution, I'm thinking this idea of uh, how to to uh, restaging, right, uh, the execution. And, and so this idea of, of, of being um, very public, public effect and, and moving from the individual to the public effect, especially important for Gerson. And I think it's important as we move forward into the, the early modern period. So that's, that's, that's it. Thank you, terrific. And Jonathan, can you introduce yourself for us? Sorry? Wrong, Jonathan. You're mute. You're mute. You're mute, Jonathan. Okay, sorry about that. I had done that not to interrupt the other presenters. Hello, my name is uh, Jonathan Reed. I am an associate professor of uh, Renaissance and Reformation history at East Carolina University. And my primary area of uh, Research and interest is in the early 16th century France on the evangelical movement in France and how that uh, developed and then morphed into the Huguenot movement of the mid to late 16th century. Um, this is also my first time presenting at French Historical Studies Conference. Uh, I don't consider myself primarily as a French historian and I'm intrigued to be in a session with French historians and potentially speaking to other French historians along the whole history of French history. And um, uh, the way I would like to situate my paper and my research at this point is, is that I believe that the uh, Reformation in France as it was and in the rest of Europe was one of the first ideological movements um, mass movements in the history of Europe, along with those movements in the French and American revolutions and then the socialist and communist movements later on. And what I'm concerned is to um, understand in my particular time and place, how a new ideology that created identity, uh, radically different identity and potentially demands for a new formation of society, either um, in its social structures and or political ones was introduced into France uh, from the German Reformation and comparatively to situated against these other revolutions and times and in, in place. And so my paper for this conference was actually looking at the agency of religious figures in the church, those who were susceptible to reformed ideas and then brought them into the French church, preached, formed conventicles and that. And what I'm trying to find out is um, the number of them who are actually operative in a 40 year period between Luther's break, 
with the church and the beginning of the French Wars of Religion in the early 1560s. It fits into a broader um, project in which I'm trying to profile what was going on in the French cities, um, the different types of people who were attracted to the reformed message, the way in which they uh, lived and operated during this 40 year period underground, and the agency of French Catholic clerics seems to me in my research to be incredibly important. And I'm trying to, in a very sort of nuts and bolts way, just try and calculate the emploi, the, the number of them who were operative in France um, during this period fits into a broader um, profile of research that looks at actually the agency of lay groups, including men and women from the early 1520s to the 60s, who were important in sustaining the evangelical underground that eventually came out as the, uh, or at least portions of it did, as the Huguenot movement in the 1560s. So my paper is a very nuts and bolts attempt to calculate the number of these uh, change agents, if you want to use modern terminology, these super uh, spreaders of evangelical ideas in that 40 year period. Uh, and um, the reason I think this is important is that um, when it comes to mass movements of ideological change in the different periods, if we go back to the Jacquerie in the medieval period, through the front, through the uh, the, the Huguenot movement in the middle of the 16th century to the Catholic League, to the, to the Fronde, up to the French Revolution, all the way up to 1968. One of the big challenges is to, or even in modern political elections, is to understand the number of people and those who are actually making a difference in terms of driving the ideological agendas that are moving events as we go forward. And this is my attempt to identify some people in the 16th century in my particular venue. And I'd love to hear from other people in times and places about who the, the big actors were who made things happen in other times and places. There were 6,000 Bolsheviks at the beginning of the, the Russian Revolution, only a third of the Americans during uh, the colonists at the beginning of the American Revolution were behind that revolution. So I'm interested in sort of comparative analyses of the dynamics of groups and those who bring the ideas to those groups and then those who actuate them in actual change. So. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, you might not think of yourself as a French historian, but I assure you that French historians think of you as a French historian. I mean, any person who works on, on French noblewomen of the Renaissance knows your book. I mean, spends hours and hours with it. So, um, yeah, uh, so I think that more today than any other time in history, maybe, we are all constantly aware of affect as a sort of problem um, concerning the body politic. I mean, who gets these movements started, um, how they get started, which movements are dangerous and which movements are, are helpful. So um, I'm just going to open the floor and um, we can talk about the individual papers if people have comments or we can start maybe with a more general comment. Um, Anna Lynn, I think you said you had a, a sort of general observation you'd like to throw out. So why don't we take that and, and then we'll just go from there. Well, that was a little bit what you were uh, saying just right now, this idea of moving from the concept of effect, which is often considered on the individual experience, and a lot of us do that. And, but I also see how if this idea of uh, how to, it can lead to uh, a control or lack of control of the, the, the public order, right? Uh, and and uh, this idea of individual body moving to, to the order of the body politic. And I think all of us more or less touch upon that idea uh, how, how individual, you know, <laughs> some clerics, some that, you know, as considered as dissent or are uh, fitting in because uh, and are disturbing of this uh, public order, right? Uh, so that's, that was for me something very interesting. And going back to what you just said, uh, Jonathan, who are those people <laughs> who started and how, how, how you know, a, a few individuals, you know, you have specific numbers, uh, a few nuns, a few, I mean, people that, I think, I think it's, it's something very interesting. And I, maybe it speaks to today too, right? To, to the situation we, ha we are in, um, you know, the, I don't know, the case zero, right? And then you have this, <laughs> the entire 
world is affected. <laughs> so uh, I think there's, there's a, 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 this is what I, one of the common threads I saw, this idea of controlling or setting aside, like in, you know, Gabriel Gauchard, you know, and recreating the sense of communion that she's lacking, uh, the sense of communion in, in both sense, right, through the Eucharist, but also as a community of, of Christians. So all of, I think, spoke to me, and this was my sort of a general <laughs> um, and if I could just pull Jonathan Smith's paper in here too. Um, yes. I was interested in the, in the problem of people getting all excited to see this execution and then being disappointed that it wasn't quite quite spectacular enough. And of course, you think of Foucault and the whole story about the movement towards more. Um, I don't know. It's a sort of less 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 beautiful, brilliant, spectacular, hideous, gruesome executions. And I'm wondering, was the public maybe not ready for that yet? Was that the, the, the product of a couple of, of enlightenment thinkers? I mean, the public was maybe, maybe today the public would still be happy to watch executions. Yeah. I think there's, um, if I, on this one, it's, it's, it's interesting to go back. If you look at the history of public execution in France, it goes back a very, very long way back to the, certainly the 14th century. People were executed in public. People who, especially uh, political executions, let us say political in inverted commas, where the um, people made the pen and did the, the walk through Paris all the way to get to the Place de Grève be, to, be, to be formally executed sometimes horribly. I mean, as I say in my paper, French had more and more disgusting ways of killing people than you can shake a stick at. Um, the, it was part of public life, very much so in, in, in pre-revolutionary France. It didn't happen every week. It's not like the, the, the Grand Terreur, but it did happen regularly. And when it happened, it became a public holiday and people turned out. And the thing about the, the, the first execution with the, with the guillotine, I, I didn't have time in my paper, but there's some lovely comments in the Paris press about people unpacking their picnic baskets and opening the bottle of wine and suddenly turning around, it's all over, it's gone. You know, we're, what are we gonna do now? We're here, we're here for a couple of hours. We're here to have a holiday. It was a, a, that sort of a public spectacle. Um, and and it, it, still is. it still is. We had one most awful public execution recently in America when a policeman killed a man by kneeling on him. That was a public execution. Thank God most people think that was awful and horrible and we must do something about it. But it is still there, and there are still people, regrettably, certainly if you look at some of the nastier parts of the Facebook world, who think it was a good idea and think it was a bit of a spectacle. Yep. I, I, I take Anne Ellen's point very much that you've got to look at where this comes from. And looking at the revolution, it is almost impossible to find what Jonathan calls the, 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 the people who make the thing happen. They're very difficult to find. We know about Robespierre. What we don't know is who was whispering in his ear. We know about lots of people. We know about, the, and above all, we have to be very, very careful. And I'm sure this is true of all of you when you're doing your research. People who write about themselves, it's called memoirs, are always always putting up the best possible story for posterity mm. and if you read some of them you know that really can't have been quite like that he can't have been that clever that he knew this was going to happen or that was going to happen mm. i mean uh, on the uh, classic one in england of course is if you read st thomas more you have to read him with a very and i'm a catholic practicing catholic very large pinch of salt 
he wasn't as great a wonderful man as he is yeah. made out to be. He, yeah, okay, yeah. made him in a saint or not, that's nothing to do with me. Yeah, I agree, yeah. But it's, it's, it's something that we historians, and Jonathan, you are a historian, you can't escape, we've got you. Um, we historians have to be very careful about it, especially in France, where the habit of writing memoirs is a national, another national uh, fad. Yeah. Definitely. Sorry, I'm going on too long. Um, oh, Anna Lynn, go ahead. I just wanted to, to, if I may, Jonathan. Also, I was, I was, I, I, I found very striking that the convention. <laughs> didn't want the guillotine too close to them <laughs> you know i thought that was very interesting they, they, they're setting all this but oh that this execution kind of you know right taking care of it, you know here right, right below our windows you know and they, they had to move it and I, I was like how what is it what is so disturbing is that you know relating to this whole sort of a public order so anyway it's just a remark but i i, I found that quite interesting so anyway to comment on that, um, I loved your description of the guillotine cabaret, um, that they would print everyone that uh, they were guillotining that day, they would do a whole menu about it. And I mean, it shows the kind of ritual and spectacle that this became and the way that this was performed um, and not just to um, inflame affect or to, you know, it, it's much easier to appeal and to uh, convince through emotion and pulling on fears and hopes and all these sorts of things. Um, but you also see the way that they celebrated with their picnics or with going to this cabaret and it, it brought people together from all over. If you look at, if you read um, um, some writers on the theater, um, Nushkin says, and she did a wonderful presentation, uh, fantastic presentation in uh, for the bicentenary. It was. A lot of it was historical rubbish, but it was very, very splendid. Um, Paris didn't need a theatre. Paris was a theatre. Every street corner was a theatre. Whether it was the guillotine or whether it was the political argument or whatever. The, the, the revolution is the most theatrical um, time you can imagine. And this goes, this, if I may come to you, Corinne, this relates to your paper. Because this is the sort of thing that um, your nun was feeling, wasn't she? Absolutely. Um, it, it's interesting because I, I think that she was perceiving the world around her with her natural senses and wanting to reject it, rejecting what she saw and smelled and felt. And she's at the same time cultivating an inner spirituality with these inner spiritual senses. Um, and you can see that she's building on... Um, all of her spiritual resources from the convent, you know, stories from past saints, um, these spiritual practices. And not only does it tie her and kind of tether her to this religious identity and to her God, but it, it tethers her to something that's not of this, not of this physical world. You know, she's able to kind of, it's almost an escapism maybe. Um, and I, I just found it very, very fascinating that she did use very physical taste words or um, sense words to express something that she made very clear was otherworldly or not not from this you know spectacle that she was observing yeah we don't have much of a, a, a um, what a, a tradition of mysticism in in Catholicism do we I mean so I was interested in that I mean you say that she sort of draws on on mystics is that is that unusual I mean I really I was curious it's the nuns of the 18th century was this something really innovative um, I, I see her, she is somewhat unique, um, I, of the revolution period, one, because we have a journal written by her that was during the reign of terror, and we just don't have that many other sources that would, um, give this sort of look into how that they practice. Mm -hmm. Um, so she, she is unique in that sense. I haven't found other nuns that wrote, um, during the revolution in the way that she was writing. Um, however, there this practice, especially, I, I rely really um, heavily on um, Caroline Walker Bynum's book, Holy Feast, Holy Fast, um, just because that example made very clear the way that food um, had a particular spiritual resonance for women. It was, you, you know, women were able to control food and 
where men would have to control their sexual appetites, women controlled, um, you know, their, their hunger appetites and the, the way that women, um, maybe communed with God. And, and I, I make the point in my paper that I think that Gosha was able to, um, in the absence of a traditional church structure, that normally a way to reach God is, you know, through your confessor and through this kind of institutional organization. Um, that institutional organization was gone. And this was an example of a way to reach God without an institutional organization. Um, that was one of the points that was brought up when we have Teresa of Avila or these um, older traditions of mysticism was that they circumvent, they found a way to get kind of the spiritual power that circumvented uh, male spiritual advisors. And so uh, I don't think she had very many um, examples to follow without this institutional church. And so I think this is one that she could rely on, that she had education on, that she could, you know, rely on whenever she, this whole institution kind of dissolved underneath her. Brilliant. Um, Jonathan Reed, can we get you in? Yeah, I just, I had a question that links a number of these papers, and I'll direct it first to Corey, and is uh, this, uh, this female nun, when she's writing this diary, it's the question of audience. Mm -hmm. Who is she writing for? And it, it applies equally to, you know, Gerson, his intended audience, or even those who are orchestrating these public rituals of executions via the guillotine. Um, I, in one of your slides in your Corin of uh, of her diary, it looks like a very early, uh, maybe an early 18th century or uh, rather 19th century uh, publication of her diary that it was soon put out there. So do you have a sense of who was she writing just for those, whatever it is, 45 other nuns in to give them sort of spiritual guidance and that she would spread this out? Or was this really intended to be for a broader audience of those who were the Catholic faithful faced up to the revolution, especially given the fact that it was then published. And just a little footnote here, she's not the first nun to do this face the dissolution of monasteries. There's a very famous chronicle or journal by Jean de Jussy in Geneva, who would, her nunnery was closed down. And this, this happened during the Reformation period where certain nuns Unlike Luther's um, Kati, who is a former nun who marries him, there are others who are not so happy about the dissolution of monasteries and they write their journals too. So who is her intended audience? Yeah, the question of audience is a good one and an interesting one. She claims at the beginning of her journal that she's writing um, to give an accurate accounting of the state of her soul. And at the beginning of her journal, she often addresses it to dear brother. Um, at one point she says, so I think she's talking to a spiritual advisor or so, someone, um, she doesn't name him. Um, she says for safety, she does not want to name this particular priest, um, or monk that she's writing to. Um, but she, she starts that at the beginning and then it's interesting because towards the end of her diary, she stops addressing, um, the dear brother. Uh, so she is claiming that this is just to give an accurate rendering of her account. Um, however, for, especially at the time of publication um, in the 19th century, we're trying to, or the French are trying to restore Catholicism. So this is part of this restoration um, effort to re-Catholicize France. Um, and I see Gosha as kind of this hero of the faith that she's maybe, we don't know how heavy a hand that editing was. Um, and uh, adding to your other comment about the dissolution, if I ever have time to pick up a couple other languages, I would love to do a comparative study of the dissolution of convents, not only in Germany, but also there was a time in Mexico in the 19th century where they dissolved convents. Um, and I think that would be fascinating to go from Reformation to the 19th century and, and compare the way that these convents in, in the circumstances, the circumstances are obviously very different, but um, producing similar results. Um, so maybe I'll let uh, someone else answer. I know that on Ellen, also the question of audience might apply there as well. Oh, uh, yes, certainly. So, um, in fact, Gerson wants to talk to everybody, but, <laughs> he, and he does, uh, and, but also uh, he adapts to his audience, he's very self-conscious about that, uh, so, which is, can be confused. So he changed the language, but it changes more than just the language, the content, uh, the choice of example, uh, 
uh, especially in the vernacular from the Latin. So I've so when he talks when he said, "Well, I'm writing for the lay audience," that is, in, you know, that is not literate. It's 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 confusing because it's not exactly true. Uh, <laughs> there are some very literate lay. Uh, uh, audience and so um, this is this sort of a he presented very simply and then as I delve into his work I realized that in fact uh, he it, it is not that simple and he's exploring throughout his work um, but I think he's a, he's a, his ideas really I don't I wouldn't say evangelized but it's really definitely someone who feels like he has a, a, a duty a responsibility to talk as to as many people as possible uh, so and it's very public that's maybe the big difference uh, most of his writing are public sermons uh, that he wrote well written but they are meant to be uh, to be uh, oral or to be distributed as widely as possible. So I think he really, of course, he's in a very different position, right? He's, he's a, you know, the chancellor of the University of Paris. <laughs> he has a prominent public position. Uh, is in so I guess I guess that also gives him uh, access to a wide audience. He has his entrance and at the at the at the court. So yes, I would say, and for him, that's. Uh, that that would be that would be very different, um, and I have a question for you. Sorry, I'm going back, uh, Corinne, um, uh, because uh, I was very interested, and you said so. She was not; uh, she was more of a, a unique case, right? A very a little bit unique in her time. But I was wondering, and that's a very selfish question, uh, because Gerson write to his uh, sisters in Bruges, right? So he talked to the nuns. And, and, and he considered that they are illiterate, right? They, are not, they have no access to um, uh, university education. They, they really could not read the Latin. I mean, we don't, that is not necessarily true either. Uh, and especially if we talk about the begins, I mean, they were, those women were not necessarily uh, uneducated. So I was wondering about uh, Gabrielle, what, what is a, 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 a Type of education, what kind of education she would have, what what kind of, you said she would have read uh, some of Aristotle, Descartes. I mean, I was impressed. So I don't know. I was wondering what what would be a, a level of education. Yeah. So the visitation nuns, uh, because they often engaged in education, um, they had to kind of have a basic level of reading, writing, be able to teach it. Um, and Gosha seems to be from. Um, perhaps a wealthier family. Her family was actually from Saint-Domingue, um, and she had family in Saint-Domingue and in Long, and she was sent over to Long. Um, so we don't, we don't know much about her early life. Most of what I know about her early life comes from the introduction of the published version of her journal. There was a bishop that wrote about her. Um, if I ever get there, I would love to do some more research to figure out if, if there's more information on her family in the archives. Um, but yeah, most of the information that I have is just a brief introduction. Um, but I, I did find it interesting that her family was from Saint-Domingue and apparently they lost all of their fortunes. A couple of family members were killed um, at, at the very beginning of the turmoil um, in Saint-Domingue. So uh, the, I suspect that there was some that she was probably better off, but the fact that she was coming from Santa Meg, I'm not sure what the education was like there or how um, much she would have to know. Uh, she was in the convent for uh, at least two decades before uh, dissolution, so she kind of had had very much accustomed herself to the pattern of living there and um, the the reading writing. She also had uh, literate family members. One of her, uh, I think it was an uncle who was. She had a couple uncles that were priests, um, so I, I do know that there is there is at least some level of education, you know, in in the family as well. Um, so it, it seems that she she could definitely read and she could definitely write. Um, and there is, I would say, a higher level of literacy among nuns. There certainly were some nuns during the revolution that were still signing with X's or could not write to petition on their own behalfs. Um, but I it was a smaller number than I think previously. Thank you. Um, 
Could we turn to, to Jonathan Reed? And I'd, I'd like to ask you a question um, going back to Anna Lynn's original point about affect and the body politic. It's a really simple question. And what were, it says, what were they so afraid of? Why did they have to, to hide in conventicles? I mean, because what they were proposing was not to overthrow the church hierarchy. It just seems fairly innocuous, the, the, the reforms that they were promoting. So, so what was the big, the, the big fuss? What was everyone so worried about? Well, actually, um, one of the initial fusses that uh, can link my subject to Corinne's and to Anna Lenz actually had to do with um, Bible reading itself in the vernacular. The, anyone who knows this period will know about the Mo reform from 1521 or 1518 to uh, 1525 when Jacques Lefebvre Vétape and some of his disciples who were early humanists were promoting preaching and catechesis in the Diocese of Mo. And one of the things that uh, Jacques Lefebvre d'Etape did to promote that was translate the scriptures into French. And they led Bible studies for the laity. And the dedication is specifically to male and female Christian brothers and sisters. And so um, all of those binaries that Anna Len talks about in her paper about laity, clergy, female, male, are being broken down and this is being brought to the people. And interestingly, this was one of the key things that <clears throat> uh, was targeted by the Parliament of Paris, by its one of its chief uh, prosecutors, by the name of Lise, who was became an arch heretic hunter, and actually in one of the um, documents that uh, James Farge has published, he has this long, long uh, court piece in which he specifically cites Jean Gerson about the danger of allowing the scriptures into the hand of the laity mm -hmm. as a, a justification for the attack on the Mo group. So. Um, from the very early on, there's this whole background that goes into the medieval period about um, a reticence about bringing the scriptures into the vernacular and allowing lay people, both men and women, to have access to it, potentially individually. And this runs through the course of the next 40 years. Um, and that's not to say that Luther or Calvin were um, and this is a misnomer in the Reformation history, that they just wanted to put the pure scriptures out there for anybody to interpret any way they wanted. That's not true. Um, they saw some dangers as well, but they certainly believed that the vernacular, because Latin was an imposition over against the laity and against men and women, they wanted to get that out there. And so this was one of the first things they targeted, and they targeted again and again over the next 40 years. They saw it as a potential threat. It was an existential one. It wasn't a real literal one in terms of revolutions or whatever. And in terms of their going after this for 40 years, compared to the Jonathan, Jonathan Smith's statistics about the number of people killed during the uh, revolution, there were only about 500 people executed for her heresy over this 40-year period. And those executions were very often for arch hesiarchs who were um, preaching heterodox doctrines that they thought were, uh, the authorities thought were undermining the community. So it was an existential threat. It was unlike the revolution, but it was enough to cow the others to, into silence at different periods. When a preacher who was preaching doctrines along the lines of the Protestants would get called in before authorities, um, so very many of them would actually flee, a few of them would get killed, or they would retract. And so that's, the, that's another point of my studies is you don't need heavy-handed repression to be effective. You don't need to kill thousands, millions. You just need exemplary punishment that keeps the masses down. Yeah, I actually had a question about this kind of relating. I liked the way you framed your paper, um, especially in the context of COVID. Um, and so my question was, looking maybe beyond your data, um, how do you explain the fact that Catholicism was so um, kind of dominant? Or was the Catholic League just effective at flattening the curve? Was the suppression of heresy just um, able to kind of quell the, the pandemic of heresy? Or how do you explain after the revolution kind of France remaining pretty staunchly Catholic? Yeah, well, that's the, uh, the other question um, I have in all of this. There's a sort of default mechanism we have looking at history of dissent 
that those who dissent and step forward, you know, you count them. And if they're in the minority, the assumption is, the default assumption is that the, all the rest are in the majority. And um, given the statistics that we know about, you just mentioned nuns who weren't able to sign. There's plenty of evidence, actually from Mo and other places, that the majority of Catholic clerics didn't know more than no more than to just recite the mass. They didn't understand their faith. They couldn't give a, a, an account of it. So my question is, you know, if you were to do the Pew Research um, uh, survey of the 16th century, could you get Catholics and Protestants on either side, this was a big critique of the Protestant side, actually to give a reasonable account of their faith? I don't think it would have been true on either side. So what you're talking about is some very small minorities of well-educated people on the margins, and the mm -hmm. fact that 90% of the population are peasants out in the countryside. Um, I think we're looking at urban phenomenon of literate elites, um, mm -hmm even within the laity and this whole idea about the majority being there. That's a big sociological question that I'd love to hear other people weigh in about. And I'd love to hear how it played out in the revolution or 1848, 19, uh, 1968 or whatever. What proportion of the population really are involved in that? I know there's a small proportion for my group in, in terms of the number of um, well-versed Catholic priests and or laity in France in the 16th century, we don't have a good measure of that either. And so that's sort of the challenge I'm laying down is to us to come up with a good sociological mo model of ideology or belief and the way it plays out sociologically, politically. Yeah, um, so I see Annalyn and Jonathan both want to comment and I'm, I need to say that we are close on our 45 minutes a lot. So why don't we hear from you two and then we're going to have to sign off. So, so Annalyn, go ahead. Oh, just, uh, I found that very interesting also, uh, Jonathan uh, Reed, you, following uh, up on what you're saying, um, you mentioned those clerics didn't try to, uh, they, they were within the establishment, they didn't try, that, uh, you know, to actually be uh, uh, disrupting this. Uh, so I was wondering if you had uh, any information about those clerics? I mean, are they, are they, do they belong to some particular orders? uh religious orders or i mean i'm just curious a little bit if you could quickly tell us um from this yeah quickly from the statistics it's uh if you look at the numbers of clerics that i've counted up from various sources that i mentioned it's a little over half or from mendicants and the religious orders a lot of them from luther's own order in 50 the middle of the 1540s there was a, a list of 49 um augustinian clerics who was given to the, the Faculty of Theology of Paris as being um, heterodox. And there was a big investigation, I mentioned that. So the Augustinian order, and that actually goes back into rival theological approaches that antedate the Reformation. So there's, but it, it, was, it was mendicants who were the, in the majority. Okay, thank you. And Jonathan Smith, you had one last question. Just to say that that, that, that is a very interesting point. 1789, the, the famous Oath of the Tennis Court. Who came over to sign it with the third estate, the second estate, 60% of which were, not, were clergymen who happily removed their habits, put a pair of trousers, became members of either the convention or the assembly. There were a lot of them at it. And if you look at the de-Christianizers, almost without exception, they're ex-Catholic priests. La Cazal, etc. They're all ex-Catholic priests. It was, it is one of the things I can never quite get my head around. If you feel that way about it, why the devil are you staying in your, in your order? But it was not, one must also remember and this is very important too, that in the, by the time we got to the 18th century, the church was a profession, just like being a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher. And for most people, many people, no more and no less. They were not particularly holy. They did not particularly believe in what they told everybody on Sundays. 
it was it was still certainly in pre-revolutionary France just about the only guaranteed way up the greasy pole from peasanthood to semi nobility. So there were a few like uh, Corinne's uh, Gabriel. There were a lot like Corinne's Gabriel. There was a lady in Lyon, I remember, another Visitandine, who was exactly like Gabriel and who re tried to refound the, the Visitandine in 1804. Yep. Yes, Mel Duchenne ended up trying to refine it, right. refound her covet. And I will also say there's nuns on the other side, um, Hebert, or ended up marrying a former Catholic nun. Well, look at Dom Gell. Dom Gell tried everything and finished up as a clerk, marrying one of uh, Catherine Theo's ex uh, angels. Yep. <laughs> okay, um, I just want to thank all of you for this wide ranging and fascinating discussion. And um, I, I'm so sorry that I'm not speaking to you in person, but um, hopefully in, in better days, we'll all be together. So, so bye, thanks again. Thank you to you. Thank you, thank so, you. Uh, we'll, we'll call in that rain check to visit you in New Zealand sometime. <laughs> okay, that's terrific. That, this is from New Zealand, Tracy. Oh, which, which one do you have there? Do you have a, what this is that? Is a, this is an Otago Pinot Noir. Gorgeous, yeah, okay. <laughs> Drink Cheers, stuff. everyone. Nice to, meet you, John, nice to meet and you, Cohen. I'll send you all a link to the new book, if you'll permit me. Sure, and, uh, also, uh, Tracy, thank you very much for your moderation. Excellent. Thank, thank you all very much. Yes. yes. Thank you, Tracy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. God bless all. <laughs>